everyone and welcome to the podcast of English composer Andrew Downs. My name is Paula Downs, I am Andrew's younger daughter and on today's show I'm very excited to be reading the first chapter of Around the Horn by my grandfather Frank Downs. Andrew Downs' father Frank was born in Walsall in 1921 and was involved with orchestral music both as a player and teacher for all his life. After being broadcast on the BBC as a pianist while still at school, he switched to the French horn. As a member of the wartime RAF Central Band, he worked with many who were to become household names, in particular Dennis Brain, and formed a close friendship with the pianist Dennis Matthews. Later, in the Liverpool Philharmonic Orchestra, he worked with Sargent and Beecham. In 1949, he joined the City of Birmingham Symphony Orchestra as a principal. In Birmingham, he also played for the BBC Midland region, then under the energetic direction of John Manderwell, and for the theatre at Stratford-upon-Avon, where he encountered the young David Munro. He is particularly remembered by those he taught at the Birmingham School of Music, later Royal Birmingham Conservatoire, where he was for many years head of orchestral studies, and for his connection with the Open University, of which he was made an honorary master in 1986. Around the Horn by Frank Downs Chapter 1 Early Years in Walsall 1927 was a momentous year in the history of my hometown of Walsall, and also in my personal recollections. In that very year I vividly remember five events as though they happened yesterday. Walsall were defeated by the famous Corinthians by 4-0 in the third round of the FA Cup. I was a football fanatic at the tender age of six. This was followed by another eclipse, a total one of the sun, which was watched by thousands of people from a local beauty spot, Bar Beacon. Then Jerome K. Jerome was honoured with the freedom of Walsall on February 10th, three months before a thunderbolt struck a house in Temple Street during a severe thunderstorm on May 4th, and finally... Flight Lieutenant Webster, winner of the Schneider Cup trophy, was given a civic reception. I did not witness any of those events, though I heard the thunderbolt, and I heard lurid details of the damage caused to the house and its unfortunate occupants. Born eighth in line of a family of ten, nine boys and a girl, I marvel to this day how we lived in such a small area. Upstairs we had three bedrooms. Downstairs there was a front room which had been converted into a shop selling boots and shoes. A living room behind it housed a piano, a large table, numerous chairs of various shapes and sizes, and a fireplace with an oven, supplemented by one of the Dutch variety much favoured by our father. From my earliest childhood, music seemed to pervade that household, though I still find it difficult to understand how it came about. Neither of our parents was really musical, and the immediate environment was hardly conducive to music making. A slaughterhouse at the rear of the house, and trams rattling by every few minutes over the cobbled street at the front. Having said that our parents were not musical is not to say they were not interested. Indeed, they encouraged us all to play an instrument. Piano, violin, cello, banjo, mandolin, trombone and horn could all be heard over the years. Our father, with his delightful black country humour, used to say that music in the family must have stemmed from his grandfather, who was a clog dancer in Willenall. Willenall was a small black country town three miles away and famous for its locksmith industry. Stafford Street, we lived at number 111, was a busy, noisy, cobbled road with tram lines running from the centre of the town to Blockswich, two miles to the north. There never seemed to be a quiet hour during the daytime, and I still marvel to this day how my brother Herbert managed to practice the violin for six to eight hours a day in the front bedroom. Trams rattling by, shaking the very windows in their frames, and the clattering of horses' hooves on cobblestones 
was hardly conducive to serious study. But Brother Herbert was a remarkable character by any standards. Twelve years my senior, he contracted infantile paralysis, polio, at a very early age, and as a result was seriously handicapped, having to wear irons on his leg until his teens. One needs to look no further to illustrate his sheer persistence, grit and determination than to quote the anecdote of his entering a school cross-country run, a distance of four miles. Crossing streams and scaling fences, he doggedly finished the course, two hours after the school gates had been closed for the night. Not to be defeated, he knocked at the school caretaker and insisted he signed the register to prove he had completed the course. He was rewarded the next day in front of the whole school with joint first prize. Herbert loved pigeons and took a great interest in the pigeon racing fraternity of the area. After saving his pennies, he bought a bird for a sixpence, causing great excitement amongst us all. In a small cage fronted by wire netting, he kept it and tended it with great devotion, giving it the name Pimple. About a week later, the pigeon escaped. Filled with remorse, Herbert nevertheless kept up his violin practice, breaking off from time to time to search for his beloved bird. A few days later, with great joy, he discovered that it had returned to its original owner a mile away. He was not at all pleased, however, when that owner claimed another sixpence for the cost of corn to feed it during the week. This was not to be the end of Pimple's exploits. After a short time, it escaped again and flew onto the roof, flopping along the ridge tiles of the terraced house to the end of the street. Poor Herbert followed Pimple gamely until it disappeared behind a chimney. Picking up the trail again a street later, he followed it to Blockswich two miles away before losing it completely. Limping and tired, he turned towards home, sad and dejected. Pimple had finally gone. But it hadn't. Herbert could not believe his eyes. In the backyard, sitting in its cage, was Pimple. It had returned earlier. He had been following the wrong bird. Pimple never really came up to expectations. It was never entered in a race, but I recall that at that time I must have had some quite extraordinary ideas of procreation of the species. I used to plant pigeon feathers in the ground and water them in the belief that a bird would eventually grow. Disillusioned at the lack of success in this field, my interest waned, however, and I do not remember what finally happened to Pimple. The single most endearing trait of my brother Herbert was his kindness and care for others. In spite of his physical handicap, which in those early days was quite considerable, he seemed always to be ready to advise and help, particularly the younger members of the family. From a very early age I had an admiration for him bordering on hero worship. His devotion to the violin in his teens was incredible. He always seemed to be practising, and long before I began school I used to sit on the bottom step of the stairs listening for long periods fascinated by the sounds from the bedroom above. I don't remember the occasion, but I am told that it was this fascination which prompted me one day to begin my career in music at the tender age of four. Apparently one morning, sitting at the foot of the stairs, he was playing the second movement of the Mendelssohn Concerto. I climbed onto the piano stool and played the tune with appropriate left-hand accompaniment. As a result of this, I began piano lessons with a marvellous man in the town, Harry Farmer. Though himself only in his late teens, Harry was an incredibly gifted musician and pianist who eventually became one of the country's leading cinema organists, playing as resident organist of many of the famous London cinemas, as well as broadcasting nationally for many years. Sadly, he died recently in Canada, where he had been director of a radio station. I remember him as an extremely kind man. With my Roland piano tutor tucked under my arm, I would be met by him from the tram in the town centre and he would take me to his studio, a room above his father's newsagent shop, and this had, unusually, a section devoted to the sale of sheet music. His shop was situated next door to the Palace Cinema, where Harry was, at that time, the resident pianist, and he would frequently take me to sit beside him whilst he played piano music to the silent films. I was fascinated on two counts. Watching the films and by his truly amazing powers of improvisation. He would then escort me to the tram once more, saying to the conductor, 
and I remember it so well. Put him off at St Peter's Church, please. However, the poor man was so preoccupied on one such occasion punching tickets upstairs that he forgot to put me off and the tram rattled past the church. I was so scared I sat there afraid to speak to anyone and eventually arrived at the terminus in tears. It was only two miles past my stop but it seemed like the end of the world. At a second attempt I was put off at the church on the return journey. The conductor on this occasion was a sympathetic being but not so on another disastrous escapade a few years later. I had been sent one Friday evening to fetch a jug of tripe. Friday was, invariably, a tripe for supper night, and the cook shop was quite a journey away. It was always a precarious undertaking, the jug being full to the brim for the return journey. The lower deck on this occasion was full, and I was forced to go upstairs. Disaster overtook me on my descent, and the conductor below had tripe before supper. In spite of all this, I love travelling on trams, and I distinctly remember having a secret aspiration to drive one. Alas, I never made it. The nearest I got was to sit on the front seat and watch the driver. It was on one of these occasions that I witnessed an event which illustrates the unique sense of humour one meets in the black country. The tram was full, and proceeding very slowly from Walsall to Wensbury. Passengers were getting restive at the snail-like crawl, and the driver was extremely agitated, continually pumping the footbell. Standing up, I could see the cause of the trouble. A butcher's boy, basket full of meat on the front of his bicycle, was about three yards ahead, midway between the tram lines, head held high and oblivious to the sound of the bell, the tram or the expletives being emitted by the irate driver. Eventually, with one hand on the driving handle, and in sheer desperation, he popped his head outside shouting, Can't you get off the bloody track? The boy wobbled somewhat as he turned his head to reply. Ah, oh, I can, but you can't. He continued on his way for about half a mile, before he turned off left to a side turning, waving as he went. Tram journeys, however, were forsaken for bus when I moved to Birmingham for lessons and chamber music classes at the School of Music, once again brought about by the guidance and encouragement of Brother Herbert. He had in 1927, at the age of 18, after further study with Paul Beard and Carl Flesch, written to Dr Adrian Bolt, then director and conductor of the City of Birmingham Orchestra, for an audition. He was successful and so began his career as a professional violinist. It was a six-month contract, October to April. From May to September, together with many colleagues of the Birmingham Orchestra, including leader Paul Beard, he would be engaged in the Municipal Orchestra of Scarborough, which consisted of an amalgamation of players from the Halle Orchestra and Scottish National Orchestra, who had similar contracts in Manchester and Glasgow in the winter months. These seaside orchestras were to play a very significant and important part in the development of the orchestral profession. They certainly improved standards of sight reading. Before the advent of the BBC Symphony Orchestra and subsequently the BBC Regional Orchestras, Bournemouth, Hastings, Worthing, Eastbourne and Torquay were, for instance, municipal orchestras along the south coast. In fact, they were crucial to the employment of British musicians after the demise of the silent films. I visited Scarborough several times during the years when Herbert was there and have nostalgic memories of the spa and the thrill and excitement of hearing the orchestra, both morning and evening in these splendid surroundings. I became familiar with the open-air amphitheatre and with standard overtures by Suppe, Ober and Rossini also with Beethoven symphonies 1 and 5. David McCallum, father of David the film actor, succeeded Paul Beard as leader. David, of course, went on to lead the Royal Philharmonic under Beecham in later years and Paul Beard the BBC Symphony Orchestra. In 
One other non-musical memory of Scarborough was of playing cricket with other children on the sands below the spa one morning. We were playing with miniature wickets, bat and a tennis ball when a tall, athletic-looking gentleman walking along the sands paused to watch. After a while, he picked up the tennis ball and bowled a well-pitched underarm towards me, giving us all advice too on how to hold the bat. He was, I noticed, a left-handed batsman, but I did not realise until I was told later that this was the great Yorkshire and England all-rounder, Maurice Leland, a legend in the cricket world, in Scarborough for the annual cricket festival. From that day on, he was my favourite player. I missed Herbert in the summer months and would look forward eagerly to his return in late September. Once he was back in Birmingham, I was able to go with him to Sunday morning rehearsals in the town hall. In those days, the orchestra would rehearse from 10am until 1pm with the concert in the evening at 7.30pm. From the age of 10, armed with miniature scores from Birmingham's excellent library, tucked away in the lower gallery of the town hall, I built up quite a knowledge of the orchestral repertoire and throughout those months I consider I was extremely fortunate to be able to do so. Succeeding Dr Adrian Bolt, who had been appointed as Director of Music to the BBC in 1930, Birmingham was fortunate enough to secure the services of a young and distinguished conductor of outstanding ability, Leslie Howard, who had he lived, would have been in the opinion of many eminent musicians, a conductor of world class. His death in May 1943 brought sorrow to the whole of the music world and in the programme for a memorial concert in Birmingham with Myra Hess as soloist and Sir Adrian Bolt as conductor, Professor Victor Helly Hutchinson, a close friend and colleague, wrote the following tribute. Leslie Howard was one of the most variously gifted of men. In music, though he chose to follow the career of a conductor, he could have risen to equal heights as a composer or pianist. Besides this, he was a brilliant talker, a ready and able writer, and no mean draughtsman. As his amazing musicianship was infused with that ease and lightness of touch which are the accompaniments of true power, so his personal relations were all formed by a glorious sense of humour, which was the reverse side of an intense seriousness and single-mindedness as regards his art. Had it not been for this single-mindedness, he would certainly have achieved wide recognition earlier, for he sedulously avoided anything like self-advertisement or exhibitionism, nor did he ever go out of his way to try and cultivate those social contacts which can sometimes do so much to speed up a conductor's career. But social success, which he could have achieved brilliantly if he had cared to, simply did not interest him. He would have regarded it as a distraction from his work. He preferred his music and the society of his own friends, and few can ever have inspired a deeper affection among those who enjoyed his friendship. It is a tragedy that now, when real recognition had at last come to him, when his wonderful genius had reached full fruition, and at a time when orchestral music is more and more widely and deeply appreciated in England than ever before, he should have been taken from us. He was only 45, and in the course of nature we might have hoped that he would be a leader of music for another generation. In artistic steadfastness, perfection of accomplishment, and catholicity of musical taste, there could scarcely be a finer one. As it is, he has passed from us at the height of his powers, and none of those who knew him will ever think of him in his zest for life and music as anything but a young man. So surely we must lay him to rest with the words which are carved on Schubert's gravestone. Music has here entombed a rich treasure, but still fairer hopes. It is perhaps not widely known that Leslie Howard had, a few months before his death, been appointed as musical director of the Halle Orchestra, and as a consequence of his death, John Barbaroli came over from America to succeed him. That fact alone shows how high in stature Howard stood in the musical world. Further tragedy was in the offing, however, when Victor Helly Hutchinson, then Head of Music, BBC London, died unexpectedly three years later in 1945, at the age of 46. Much of that wonderful valedictory tribute to Howard could have also applied to him, 
and with his passing two outstanding musicians of that generation were lost to us. Both were extremely kind to me, as I shall relate. End of chapter one. To finish this podcast episode, I will play Andrew Down's Concert Overture, Towards a New Age, performed by the Czech Philharmonic Orchestra for the Artisman label. Since this work was commissioned by the Institution of Mechanical Engineers in celebration of the 150th year of its foundation, I believe it depicts the industrial black country where my granddad was born, particularly the trams he described. Thank you.